In today's fifth race of the SO Protec BF Goodrich Formula 1600 series, a couple of questions. Can championship leader DDA Strainen hold off the challenges of Martin Hemel and Bruno Bianchi? And will Major General Lou McKenzie continue his domination of the B class cars? Walmart of the Air Quebec TSN proudly presents round five of the SO Protect BF Goodrich Formula 1600 series. Hello again, everyone. I'm Vic Rutter along with John Powell and glad to be in Trois Rivières because round the world, people know of this race course. Vic, people know this race course. Gilles Villeneuve sprang to the world's attention, beating the Formula One stars in Formula Atlantic here. I'm pleased to tell you I won here in 1972 in Formula Atlantic. This is a race in the hearts and minds of Quebec. means something in the motorsport community. It means a lot. And look, Quebecers have the entire front two rows, Vic. In fact, you talk about Jill Villeneuve in Jerry Donaldson's new book on the history of uh, James Hunt. It was James Hunt who came to race here at Trois-Rivières, went back home to England and told people over there, there's a guy named Jill Villeneuve. Keep your eye on him. He is the star of the future. They run it through the fairgrounds, in and around the Hippodrome, and they have been for years. This is the longest surviving road course in North America, in Trois-Rivières, about halfway between Montreal and Quebec City. And they have raced all kinds of cars here, including Can-Ams. Absolutely. Can I ever forget Jill Villeneuve in the Wolf Can-Am car, an evil handling automobile spinning around, or Patrick Depaye of Giacomelli driving in Formula Atlantic here, driving like roller skates. Jacques Villeneuve winning in Can-Am. Trans-Am cars racing here. Crawford, the names go on and on. Anybody who's anyone in motorsport has raced at Three River. And you make a good point because this race has a double attraction. It has an attraction to the Quebecois drivers who consider this their marquee event of the entire season. And they can measure themselves against some great international drivers. Michael Andretti, for example, or in Atlantic, or Roberto Moreno in Formula Atlantic. Yes, they have been here and of course, Jacques Villeneuve, young indie star, and his uncle. Claude Bourbonnet you saw alongside. So the Sons returned to Trois-Rivières, hoping to emulate the success of their famous fathers. A large field of 36 lined up on the grid here in Trois-Rivières as we look back now at the first four races of this year's series, and we'll begin at Mosport, and it was the driving style of Martin Guimont that won out over Bruno Bianchi. Aggressive pushing Bianchi off on the last lap, Vic, which set us up for the next race at Montreal. Yes, the battle between Imo and Bianchi continued on the Circuit Gilles Villeneuve at the Grand Prix du Canada. And this one, though, was over on the second lap. Imo was not in the lead. He wanted to be there. Bianchi was there. And then suddenly, Vic, Bianchi was out. Watch. That sets the stage, Vic, for what I believe is going to be a season-long battle between the fiery Guimont and the very fast Bianchi. Guimont suggested his brakes had already worn out. The surprise winner from Texas was Mike Sauce. I was, well, I just was trying to stay steady and, and uh, you know, be consistent, and, and uh, I turned some good laps, and I'm just real happy. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Race three was in foggy Dartmouth, Halifax, the Moosehead Grand Prix. Bianchi this time battling again, but it wasn't with Guimont, it was with Ian Willis. Ian Willis, a brilliant win. Choosing the track conditions perfectly, Bianchi wasn't pushed off. Bianchi was just flat out beaten by Ian Willis. And it was a great last lap move by Willis in his Yellow Pages car. Willis made a gamble, went under the wet, came under the dry. Bianchi started on the dry, went into the wet, and that's all she wrote. Bianchi lost that race to Willis. Race four, Montremblant. Guimont on the pole on the left, Bianchi 
outside front row. The Yankee, a stunning leap into the lead on the very difficult, drying track. Started out wet, Vic, and that set the stage for a race-long domination. And then suddenly... On the very last lap, it looked like Guimont went wide. Bianchi tried to go underneath. Disappointment in the Bianchi pit as Guimont... Disappointment, Vic. Bianchi had the race. As Guimont would go on to the win at Mont Tremblant. Didier Strainen, though, more consistent, continues to lead the points battle ahead of Guimont and Paolo Dalcin. While in B-class, Major General Lou McKenzie is the leader there for cars older than 1984. As we take a look at the starting grid, all set now, as we see, 36 cars and on the pole in a record-setting time of 112.76, Bruno Bianchi. Bruno, Bruno, I really like this guy, Vic. And really, it's been hard luck, Bruno Bianchi, so far. Starting next to him on the front row, 20-year-old Jean-Francois Veilleux. Last year raced in England, Formula Vauxhall, hopes that Trois-Rivières will be his springboard. First of all, get a good start. That's the most important thing, I guess. Uh, having Martin Guimont in my back and Bruno Bianchi in front of me, that's going to be a hard task for the race, obviously. Um, then do, go through the first lap and to see what's going to happen. Uh, but the key word here is patient, being patient. Um, history proved it. Uh, first of all, in Trivers, you have to finish, and then you, you see where we are. Hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll be able to be running up front with the, the leaders. Second row, Martin Guimont, already the winner of two races right behind Bianchi. Are you uncomfortable, Bruno? <laughs> I would think just a little bit. Outside second row, Mark Pomani in a Quebec built CMV. Pomani always challenging. New face, former ice racer. Third on the grid, Dominic Scalzo, number 62. And starting sixth, Paolo Dalcin among the leaders in points. Well, this is a very important race. It's the one of the oldest street races in North America, and, and for us, it's a very prestigious event to come to. So doing well here is extremely important. Uh, it really can help your career a lot. As the cars now head out on their warm-up lap here at Trois-Rivières, let's take a look at the rest. There you see in row four, outside, that is DDA Strainen. And remember, he is the points leader currently after four races, the rest of the field. Nick Lundgren is 16, racing from America. You know, Vic, at the start of a street race, very, very difficult. Track conditions are dirty. This is a not a real race track, but a street circuit. You see the name Lou McKenzie, that's the Major General. He is 15th on the grid, currently the top B-class qualifier in a 1981 PRS, and of course, cars older than 1984. The oldest car in the field, David Klubein, 26th position, a 1969 Merlin. And Mary Josie Lachapelle is the first woman to start an SO Protect BF Goodrich race this season. And she, like all the other drivers, must be nervous getting ready for the start. Under the Duplessis Arch, up the Boulevard Carmel, we're in Trois Rivières. The SO Protect BF Goodrich Formula 1600 Series is brought to you in part by. SO Protect, the leader in protection, engineered in Canada for superior protection. BF Goodrich Tires, because no other tires will do. And by Mini Disc from Sony, the smaller, recordable, compact disc.
Welcome back. The cars completing their warm-up lap. Take us on a tour of this challenging circuit. Very quick, Vic. And over the start finish straight, an immediate right hand 90 degree turn. And then a short burst of speed down to Desforges, a hard left hand turn. Another squirt right down to the Porte du Plessis, a large archway. And then up along the Boulevard du Carmel. It's not straight, but extremely fast. Brakes really get a workout here as you brake extremely hard to go around the corner at the end of Carmel and onto the Rue de Colomb, a long straightaway heading down to a left-hander named after the wonderful French driver Patrick de Paillet. A left there and then another left along Ryan turn. John Ryan helped create this race circuit. And then a series of, of uh, S's through the Villeneuve turn, very slow here, and then off down the Avenue Gilles Villeneuve. Here we go through the Villeneuve S's and onto the start finish straight. And Vic, who can forget Gilles Villeneuve in his glory days here? The thing I find interesting about this circuit is that there really are only two right hand turns one at the end of the start finish straight and coming out of the Gilles Villeneuve S's. Only two right handers. Everything else is a left hander. Ready for the standing start, round five of this Formula 1600 series. Remember, it's Bianchi on the pole, Veilleux outside, right behind. It is Marta Guimont. Bianchi. The ramps come up. On pole. We're going. A great start from Bianchi, but Schreiman has not moved. Oh, this could be dangerous. The flags, you see the marshals, and quickly, it is Bianchi out. Momani takes up the charge. But it's Bayeux challenging Bianchi as they go down to the bridge, and there's Schreiner. He has not had a good weekend. Not at all. In fact, on Saturday during qualifying, he tangled very badly with Bruno Bianchi, crashing his car into the wall, destroying three quarters of it. They were looking for parts to repair it, and so you have to wonder if, in fact, the points leader now has jeopardized his entire season. A lot of damage. The problem is that we don't have a lot of spare, spare parts, but here in Trois-Rivières, uh, there is a lot of uh, Formula 2000 cars, which are the same Van Diemen that we're using with a different power plant, so uh, we're going to go shopping around because we're going to need a lot of parts, and I think that the guy who uh, wants to keep that lead at the championship as bad as I do, so uh, they're going to work like hell. I mean... Uh, I mean, I hope that we'll be able to race. I don't know where we're going to start because track was lower today and we had carburetor problem last uh, last session. So uh, I was improving my time, but I don't think that I have a good starting position if we start. Guimont and Bianchi have had their misfortune in uh, Montreal and uh, in Tremblant for um, Bianchi and Montreal for both of them. That's now it's my turn. I'm not wishing them, wishing them some problems, but... <laughs> If I want to keep that lead, I will have to hope that something can, uh, can happen to those guys. Well, it's it's racing incident, but, you know, uh, I was uh, anxious to have a good uh, result here. Uh, a lot of people are surprised that I was, I'm leading the championship, me first, but <laughs> I was trying to prove this weekend that maybe I can win one. I don't think that it will be this weekend. <laughs> well, that's racing. Well, I tell you what, his crew did a great job. They found the parts, but on the start, you can see now the hand goes up, and everybody does a great job to get by him. But it was a disappointment for team manager Jim Besmer. The mechanic, Chabra Swatch, just told me that the half shaft broke, and that's the one we put on, a brand new one. I mean, it's really uh, disappointing. And we worked very hard, and the car was perfect when he went out for practice, and now we have to listen to this. You know, that's really hard to take, but uh, name it a game. Too bad that a new part of the hold. As we go back to live racing, I tell you what, that is one of the most frightening things about a standing start, is when a car fails to get off the grid. If you're a driver and you don't look up from the uh, from your gauges, boy, you're right into the back of him. But looking up, we've got Bianchi up front, Veyer behind him, holding off Gima, who is challenging Bumami behind that and we've got a great race shaping up. And I tell you what, it, this whole race now takes on a different complexion because of the points battle. Let's remember, as we've got three cars, one certainly going off, it looks like an older car as well. Looks like maybe one of the Merlins. 
and yo, you go. No, no, you go. And here they can't back up. They can't find reverse. And it's David Klubine in trouble at the corner. In the 69, Merlin. That's right. And Sam Ryan in his number 93 from Pennsylvania. So we're talking about this race. Let's remember now, with Strainen not even in the field, Bianchi has a chance to close up. Veyuk can play spoiler, and then Guimon currently running in third. He could take over the points lead. Let's look at the replay. Uh, Sam Ryan at the top of your screen uh, gets taken out by Klubine. David locked up, went straight into it. Well, that's unfortunate, and that's that. As we go back to the action, here's Momomi, and he is slipping back. Guimon moving up. Momomi not doing as well as he should. Not quite on the pace, and Vic... It's going to be a case of attrition. The economy can still gather it up. The question is, do we have the discipline to maintain the lead out front? My man Bianchi is leading. Mark Moni in that white number 60, currently running in fifth position. Oh, and not anymore. There he goes, Mark Momoni. And you talked about the attrition. And maybe are there just marbles there? What's happening? I think if you leave your braking too late, you're absolutely right, Vic. Get onto the uh, marbles and then you're done. You've got to conserve your tires as ever. But here it is. As he turned in, it's almost that he pitched the car in, and you can't pitch a car on a, on a street circuit like that and not overheat the tires. So he spins and back to the lead, and it's Bianchi, Bruno in the lead. Veyo pushing, Guimau moving up fast. And we're looking for some excitement here. But the way I see it, the Yankee, with discipline, is going to win this race. There's a fearless prediction, Vic. Uh-huh. So early with the predictions. There you see Martin Guimont currently running in third. Winner of two races so far. Has had his battles with the leader, Bianchi. And we have a car. This is Martin Walter trying to get it back together. A nice spin in that beautifully presented automobile. And unhurt and carries on. Martin Walter, the 32-year-old from London, Ontario, as we go back to the leaders, Bruno Bianchi, followed by Jean-Francois Veilleux. Oh, Jean-Francois, hold on. Sliding the car, Vic, very, very bad. It's easy to get into the temptation of saying, I can pitch the car right and left through this track, and you can't afford to do it. You overheat the tires, and eventually that will catch drivers out. Let me ask you something about the setup on a car on a track like this, when there are so many lefts and just two rights. Do you compensate and you give a little bit more to the left-handed turns than you would to the right? Depends on the individual team. I would not set the car up asymmetrically for that, but you need balance, and most of all, you need a driver who is disciplined, and that's what's going to be the key to this race as we're watching Bayer hounded by Gima Bianchi pulling it out. Bianchi is just an extraordinary driver, and Guimau and Bayer doing very well to even remain in contact here. The question is, can they handle the pace for in front of 60,000 people and all the pressure? Can they handle the pace for the whole race? Now, is this one of the passing spots at the end of the Boulevard du Carmel? Where Absolutely. They go right. Under braking. Come right in deep, but you can't afford to get too far offline because you've got to maintain the momentum and go down the next straightaway. And it's fair to say this is not a circuit. Oh, we have a car into the wall, and it is. It's Veilleur. And in the very same place where he got loose on the last lap. That's right. It cost him big time. We talk about the discipline. We talk about overheating the tires. The, the, the ease with which you can pitch the car, it caught Bayeux out on those walls. They bite. Boy, do they come up and they quickly, as you suggest, bite you. And does this ever set up an interesting battle? With Veilleux gone now, and he is obviously very disappointed. He looked back and then saw the damage and went, oh, my. And you know, that crash with Guimont behind Veilleux cost Guimont time. So Bianchi is profiting from this with a big lead. Here we go again. Bianchi and Guimont.
Welcome back to Trois Rivières, round five of the SO Protect BF Goodrich Formula 1600 series. As we take a look at the number 71 car, this is Nick Lundgren, currently running in fifth place, just 16 years of age. Another kart racer making his way up the ladder into the big time. Lundgren, just 16. Uh, Veilleur, is he, is he hurt? No, I think he's just uh, more upset with himself than anything else, realizing that he planted that car into the wall and that's how much the race here at Trois Rivières means to the Quebec driver. It means so much Vic. It's a hometown race. It's just so much pressure. An obvious then disappointment for Jean-Francois Veilleux who crashes it here at Trois Rivières and he's out. I was just coming in corner six and turned a little bit too early, clipped my apex a little bit too early, just barely hit the guardrail just travel the other side of the track fairly quickly and then barely touch the tires with my rear wheels and that pushed me back on the wall. Took the whole, the two corners, the two, the whole side of the car out. And that's the story, Vic. And we're watching Bianchi leading over Gima. Now what about Bianchi and how he thinks about this race as we watch the rest of the field snake through the villain of S's and then down the villain of start for the straight. Does he think about Gimo or does he just drive his race? You have to drive your own race. And I think Bianchi is very, very good here in measuring himself on the racetrack. And he's not conscious of Gimo at all. He better not be because Gimo knows. Now, Gimo has the advantage. He is hounding, pressing to catch up with Bianchi. Well, we've seen fathers and sons before, and that's what we want to talk about on our BF Goodrich track back. The father and son team of Oliver and David Klubine. Basically, when we decided what to do this year, uh, David very much wanted to, to join the Essel Protech series, and uh, it seemed rather senseless for me to go off and do some lesser grade of series, so I thought, well, what the heck, I'll, I'll uh, tag along with them, and we'll, we'll likely have more fun doing it that way, and it certainly is turning out that way. It, it works out very well, especially since we aren't in the same class. I'm in the A class, he's in the B class. Uh, anything we can do to help each other is definitely, uh, we will. And there's a big difference between the older Berlin style cars and the new Van Diemens. It's definitely older and uh, not as sophisticated. It makes it a little bit easier to drive. Uh, it's like driving your Honda maybe compared to, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to drive compared to the newer cars. Um, it's harder to set up though because it's, uh, it's not quite as stiff and it, the chassis tends to flex a little bit. We're very short of money and, and uh, when it comes time for new tires, uh, sometimes we don't get them and it's very important that we keep the cars in, in one piece and won't have any major crashes with them. Holly Klubine, a wonderful father, his son. What, I, there's so much of that in ra racing today, the dads and, and their kids. As we move back to Paolo Dalcin, the young man from Downsview, leading a group through a waved yellow corner. No passing there. Oh, oh my goodness. No-brainer. That's called a no-brainer. Brian Folk. I can't believe it. There's a waved yellow, slow down, there's trouble. Folks stuffs it in the corner under a yellow. But how notorious is this corner? There you see Jean-Francois Veilleux's car still stuffed in the wall. And here is Folk into the tires. A yellow says slow down, trouble ahead, no passing. And you never pass under a waved yellow. You can't win anything. So Folk gets the absolute brainless award for throwing it all away for nothing. I sound critical, Vic. You sound like an instructor. You sound like a teacher. My goodness. And it's up, up, and away for the car of Brian Folkt here at Trois Rivières. I think we're going to see a lot of this as the race wears on, people losing it. And that's going to be the story of this race. Ah! We've got another one. This is Stefan Roy into the tire barrier. Let's uh, look at the replay. Stefan Roy from uh, Saint Sauveur comes in and just I think he tagged Momami hard into the wall and look the whole side of the car ripped off uh, you'll notice that the protection that these space frame cars give is very very good almost a survival cell inside as the corners rip off and the car loses speed but he does walk away with a bit of a limp as we see now Paolo Dalcin 
under some pressure from the number 62. That is Dominic Scalzo. And this is a battle for third place. Scalzo chasing uh, Dalchin and uh, 71, Lund Green, the 16-year-old from Wisconsin in the background. Pass the start finish through one of the two right-handers. Look out! Down through Desforges, heading down to the bridge. We're watching Scalzo following Dal Chin. And after seven laps, it's Bianchi, Gimo, Dal Chin, Scalzo, and Lund Green. And make a note that the leader in B-class, cars older than 1984, Major General Lewis McKenzie is running in 15th position. Now, as we run down this race, uh, Vic, lapping traffic is going to play a move. Bianchi is going to try and time his moves so that he passes the cars going into the corners, leaving Guimau with a great big Formula Ford in the way so he can't get by. And the leaders, of course, have pulled away, and so the real battle now is back in the pack as we look back in the field. And a growth move has been made by the number seven of Mark Green. He started 14th, and he's right at the back there. He's running in seventh place as we watch this battle for third. Green from Nova Scotia doing an excellent job. Scalzo getting very hairy out there. These cars not behaving well over the bumps as the tires start to overheat. Scalzo being pressed by Lund Green. Del Chin pulling out a margin. And then, of course, Mark Green moving up. Hold and on. we have a spin. All the way down, off the walls, it's a blue car. What a great job of keeping it off the concrete. Martin Roy from Montreal, and as you say, this is one of the things about this track. It is very tight, and it is very bumpy. Demands precision. Look at that. He got loose. He came out too hard on the power and slides down the track, locks him up, keeps off the wall, releases the brakes, lets it around, grabs first gear, off he goes again. And there's another... Uh, spin. Uh, I think the spins are happening faster than the cameras can pick it up. And there's a, 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 a lap car going wide. Bianchi slips through. Guima has now got two cars to get by to try and catch up with Bianchi. Bianchi behind Klubine now. And he's looking for a way by. Yes, goes right, goes left, goes underneath, leaving a third car for Guima to contend with as they head down to the Duplessis Arch and head along the Boulevard de Carmel. And exactly, these, these back markers now start to come into play. And you see exactly, there he goes. There's your leader, Bruno Bianchi. Again, past one of the back markers. Stretching out, trying to get past number 70, uh, yet, putting yet another person. And there's Lou McKenzie. What a wonderful job Lou is doing. He is the leader in B class, leader in the race, running 15th, leader in point standings after four. Lee Rassico is currently in second place as we ride along with Lou McKenzie. What a great shot this is with our little Sony uh, onboard cameras looking back at Lou. Two hands on the wheel, uh, shifting very precisely. Uh, pretty decent position here. I should mention the PRS was raced by Davy Jones in Canada when Davy Jones at 16 came up here to race as we watch Bianchi, who has a formidable lead over second place Martin Guima. One, two, three, four cars between Bianchi and Guimau. And you know what? The thing that I noticed immediately is the line of some of those cars. There just isn't any. And that must make it more difficult for Guimau. Absolutely. And you know, Bianchi really doesn't mind. But go, oh, there's Guimau. Missed another opportunity. Now he has to try and get down before the arch. Willie, yes, gets by one more. Three more back markers to pass, and down the Boulevard de Carmel, it will be easier down the straightaway for Guima, but not an easy job to close on Bianchi. He can barely see Bruno Bianchi ahead of him as Martin Guima tries to close the gap. And even he starts to twitch a little bit. Always a game to keep the car handling right, preserve the tires, and be there at the finish. Yankee has to be disciplined. Gima, a lot to lose, and a very, very tough road to go. Bruno Bianchi continues to lead comfortably over Mark Gima. Paulo Dalcin is third.
Welcome back to Trois Rivières. Vic Roder along with John Powell. And yes, there is your leader. That is Bruno Bianchi. Hard luck, Bruno. And continues to lead after 11 laps. And comfortably as we wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. And finally, there is the second place car of Mark Dion. I consider this a stunning job. Not very exciting to watch, but a stunning job that uh, Bianchi is doing to lead this race. Just excellent drive. You know, we've talked about the other courses, for example, Mosport or Mont Tremblant, where there's a rhythm. There is no rhythm here. Oh, yes, there is. I don't mean to just another spin. And this is Vertiver running eight. Christian Vertiver has spun at the same corner where Veur's car is still parked, and there is a Ooh. held yellow. This is a difficult corner, but yes. Look at the battle for fourth, fifth, and sixth. Dominic Scalzo in the black number 62. Goes to the outside. Oh my goodness, through the S's here, the right hander. And getting him back, the number 47 is Daniel Samari. Back in the pack, that's where all the cars are. There you see Lundgren, the 16 year old. Now the back markers, and look at this battle. Lundgren goes through cleanly through turn one. He's broken through, and now there's a bunch of cars. There's a yellow car in there, 24, I think is Peters from Ottawa. And of course, 47 is Lundgren, and then the Scalzo in the 62 car, all picking their way through, having a great dice. And this is where the battle goes on between the two classes of cars. You know, the A-class cars, then the B-class guys who are older than 1984. It's almost as if you just try and pass whoever the heck it is. You don't know who they are, where they are, and there's three abreast. And there's a wonderful move by the McDonald's. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. Up and over, and we have Scalzo and Oliver Klubein getting together. Oliver hit very hard, upside down into the tires. He went right over the top. And we have a red flag, Vic. Now, what that means, tell your audience, they are calling for help here, looking for a tow. It is a scary thing about open wheel racing, though, because the cars do launch off of each other when they Next, do touch wheels. Let's look at the replay. He just tags the right rear wheel of Scalzo and goes up and straight into the wall. Now, I think he's okay. I saw some movement in that last shot. I think he's okay. I'm sure he is. And we look again once more. Up and over and straight in. Now, the tires offer protection. Oh, you see, but the arms were hanging out. He didn't, wasn't able to keep his arms in the car. There's a lot of force involved in the rollover. We're looking from another point of view. He turns in and it's 62, right up. Look at the hand yeah. come out. But into the tires, and I, I, I hope he's okay. They have to get the car up, our right side up, get the driver up very, very carefully. And there's Veilleur uh, holding a fire extinguisher. The safety crews responding very quickly. And of course, in a red flag situation, they're lining all the cars up while the emergency crews attend to the problem. Oliver Klubein, Vic. There, they're bringing the car over, and the uh, paramedics are with him. Very, very carefully bring it over. The response crews at uh, motor racing uh, events are extremely well trained, and they're in good hands here, uh, looking after uh, possibly an injured driver. And surprisingly, John, there is a Dominic Scalzo's car. We it, thought after the collision, you know, that he was okay, but obviously, you know, he's broken must, the suspension. Must have been uh, hurt and then uh, crashed a couple of corners later. Very, very difficult. There's David Klubein. He has stopped, gotten out. Veyer is with him. You have, this is very, very difficult. You've got to keep the, the, the people away from the crash scene while the paramedics deal with it. One more shot. There's uh, Ali Klubein into the tires. Now watch the arms, you see. They're hanging straight down, and then the car comes down on top of Ollie Klubine, and that's where you think the injury may have taken place. As you say, Jean-Francois Veilleux, other officials trying to reassure his son that dad is okay. You have to wait, let the paramedics deal with it. I think the roll bar of the car is what protects everybody, and uh, uh, we've just received word uh, here that uh, Ollie is in fact okay. Uh, while they reform the grid, uh, we'll go back and have a look and find out uh, from the uh, paramedics exactly what the story is on Ali Klubein's accident. Can we can we point a finger here? Did Ali have the, the right line or should he have given way? Being a B-class car 
to Scalzo? Uh, very difficult to say. He had the line going in, but you know what? You've got to give racing room, so that's a racing incident. There goes uh, Klubine into the ambulance. And we're very glad to tell you that, you know, cuts and bruises and a broken finger, and that are the extent of uh, the injuries to Ollie Klubine, and for that, we are thankful. And we're shaping up now for a restart, one pace lap, a single file start, and then a 10 lap sprint. Bianchi is the leader. And so remember now, it'll all close up, of course. Bianchi, Guimont will be right on his tail. And then following in third place will be Paolo Dal Chin as he looks to make up ground in the point standings. Well, the car is going really well so far, and uh, I'm going to try and get, uh, just try and keep up with Martin and uh, Bruno and see what we can do from there. It's 11 laps, so it's going to be a bit of a sprint race, but you don't want to make your moves too early. And the leader in the B-class cars, just waiting it out, is the retired Major General Lou McKenzie. And Lou McKenzie is the subject of this week's ProTech Profile. Most summer weekends, you can find him up to his elbows in Greece, but wearing a big smile at racetracks. Lou McKenzie must rival Paul Tracy and Jacques Villeneuve of Canada's most famous race driver. If fame is measured in international TV interviews, well, McKenzie then is the hands-down winner. The Major General who commanded the United Nations forces in the former Yugoslavia has now retired from the armed forces, but his opinions are still sought by reporters and heads of state alike. His career as a writer was an instant success. His first book, a national bestseller. However, through it all, he has maintained his love of motor racing. It was 1975, I was 35 at the time. Most race car drivers' careers are over by that stage. And I was in Germany, and for the first time woke up at the end of the month and I had a little bit of money left after all the bills had been paid. And my wife Dora and I worked out a deal that I would go racing for one year just to see whether I liked it or not. Well, I guess that's about 19 years ago. Well, we've been doing it ever since. I'm 54. Uh, I don't want to play seniors volleyball, seniors basketball, seniors baseball or whatever. I want to be competitive. And motorsport is one of the few sports where you can do that. And not only that, while you're doing it, you're camouflaged. I mean, people looking at me go by in corner two at Mosport don't know this is a 54-year-old idiot out there competing with 18-year-olds. It's not until you get out of trying, try and get out of the car at the end of the race, they might be suspicious. But I mean, you're covered with all the clothing and, and, and helmets, so you can sort of still compete with the kids, and, and I enjoy that. I'm not there to become a Formula Atlantic IndyCar Formula One driver. I'm there as that part of the SO ProTech series that's there as a hobby, as a, as a, as a way to relax. Uh, and to enjoy myself, whereas the, uh, you know, the Paulo Del Chins of the world and, and, and the very good drivers, the Martin Guimans, you know, they're there because they're on their way up the ladder, and, uh, and it's just a privilege to be able to compete with them as they're moving up the ladder, but I'm quite happy in Formula Ford. And happy as the leader in B-class cars, the pace car is in. We are coming through the Villa of Esses. We are getting ready for the green flag, and it is now a 10-lap sprint, and Bianchi has a great jump. A single-file restart. Bianchi times it perfectly. Gima at least two seconds behind as they sprint to the finish. Third, Dal Chin, and right behind him is Mark Green from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. He's having a great race, Vic. He qualified 14th, and now he's challenging as they get back through a few slower cars uh, Green has moved up to fifth. What a remarkable start that was. And I want, that's the thing though, on rolling starts, it is your leader who sets the pace. Where was Gimo? Well, it's single file, and there was a guy in between him and uh, a back marker because that's the way they, they started it. And I don't know, Gimo obviously doesn't start very well. This is about the third start I've seen him blow. And uh, Bianchi had it timed perfectly. Well, good for Bianchi because it's a sprint to the finish. Nine laps to go. Puff of smoke there. Probably somebody. It looked like it may have been Gimo locking up the brakes a little bit. But there is that number seven car. 
Mock Green from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, has moved on up now and in that battle with Paolo Dalcin for fourth overall. It's Bianchi to Gima, to Dalcin, Green, and then back uh, a little bit, Lund Green, the 16-year-old from Wisconsin, who was going so well. He didn't get a good start on this restart single file. As we head down under the bridge, Bianchi and Gima once more, then Delchin, uh, the slower car, and then Green and Lund Green. Daniel Samari tries to get past uh, Perigny in the number 10 blue car, doesn't make it, and see how much time Vicky's lost. He makes a move, and then he's got to work his way up, and it takes so much. Tenth after tenth, you've got to work it up. You see one of the cars here, look at this, signaling to Guimau, go inside. How does Bianchi's mind change now? Before he was comfortably in front, as we have a car off, that is Simon Mayat from Nova Scotia being pushed off the course. But before he was comfortably in front, now he sees the race. He really has to run two races in one. I think Bianchi's just concentrating on not putting a foot wrong. Everywhere he goes, he's looked after his tires. There's Momami, uh, who's dropped right back after a spin. But uh, Bianchi, discipline, concentration, precision, smoothness, that's what you're getting out of Bianchi. You can't afford to think about anything else there. Battle back in the pack, and again, it's B-class cars. You see Ricardo Revy putting his hand up, signaling to Sylvain Lefebvre, take the inside line through the start-finish straight and into turn one. And that's something you've got to be conscious of. You've got to know who's coming up behind you. Good discipline there from the uh, slower cars, letting uh, the other cars through, giving racing room. And we need room because the concrete walls are formidable as we watch Lundgren in the 71 car just uh, racing down just in front of Perigny under the Duke de arch and up the Carmel straightaway. Let's talk a little bit about this 16-year-old. Uh, we talked about the SCCA rule in the United States. That's why he's up here. You cannot race until you're 18 in Sports Car Club of America rules. You can race when you're 16 and have a driver's license and go to school in Canada. So there's Lund Green, a junior light championship in karting, doing a good job just holding off Perigny in the number 10 car. And an interesting story, of course, people who follow Indy Lights as Perigny goes to the inside, makes the nice move and gets him, and, and now loses the line, and does Lundgren get him back? Lundgren no, Perigny tries. holds Doesn't up. Make it. But Greg Moore from uh, British Columbia, who races Indy Lights, same problem confronted him. He couldn't go Formula Atlantic racing, that's why he went Indy Lights, because he got the permission to race when he was 18. There you go. And Lundgren has dropped a spot. Perrin, he took it back and he tried to get it back, has not been able to. Challenges, takes a look, pulls back in behind Perigny. It's so tough in single-seater racing, Vic, because if you take a look too long and go offline, you lose too much ground, you can't close up quickly enough to pass again. So Lundgren is haunting Perigny, trying to get his position back as they go underneath the Duke de Siage, and there's Lou McKenzie. Well, Lou McKenzie's still leading a B-class, 13th overall, but interestingly enough, here he is in a battle with Don Valance in the number 51, Valance from Bolton, Ontario. He's in an A-class car, so sometimes you do get the battle between the two classes. Get cars together, you get a race, come to Three Rivers, and you have a great time. 60,000 people watching this motor race, and there is Lou McKenzie in the PRS. Valance behind him in the Swift, twitching a little bit under braking, and uh, boy, Lou, keep it cool there just bouncing around as they uh, go down to the next corner. Yeah, you can see him check his mirrors. He wants to uh, find out where Valance is. Valance looking to the inside now, the left-hander. Coming out, Valance goes on the inside, pulls back in, and you can see just in this beautiful Sony handicap shot, there's Valance on the inside. Well, Valance looked like he may have just lost a little bit there and in then, the S's. And look at Lou, he's looking over his right. He's looking in his mirrors too much, Vic. You've got to concentrate. I think Valance got by him. No, there goes Valance down the inside. Into turn one. Oh. Has he got the line? Looks like Valance took it away. Yeah. You know, there's a rule that says don't look in your mirror too much because if you do, you slow yourself down. I think that's what happened to Lou as Valance pulls away and we go back to number four. Bruno Bianchi leading this motor race.
And let's emphasize again the tough luck that Bruno Bianchi has had in the first four races. You know, the tangles with Guimont to knock him out in three of the races, and then really being beaten on a, a good last lap effort by Ian Willis. So Bianchi, maybe, maybe the time has come for Bruno here at Trois Rivières. I certainly hope so. This young man deserves it. He's driving an impeccable motor race. And yes, he lost to Willis in Nova Scotia. He got cheated by Guimard at the other races at Mosport, at Montreal, at Montreal. Will he be cheated in three rivers? I think not. You know, I think sometimes too, John, we forget. We look at this, and this is like a, a Sunday drive, it would seem. But this can be almost more difficult to drive with nobody pressuring you than somebody right on your tail. Very, very difficult indeed. You're right, Vic. Oh, and there is Gimo sliding on a little bit of the cement dust less from the Klubine accident of that turn. This is not a nice place to get loose. Gimo has to control it, and that's the discipline that perhaps is lacking in Gimo that we're seeing in Bianchi as he does not appear to set up a real wrong as they run down to the checkered flag on the, uh, the penultimate lap, which means two to go, Vic. Bruno Bianchi getting the last lap now on his way to what he hopes will be his first win of this season. In second, Martin Gima. And you figure he's just trying a little too hard here. But he's trying everything he can to close the gap because winning is everything. And Dal Chin from Downsview is in third, but a very distant third. The only person who can even think about first place is Gima. And as the clock winds down, I'm afraid that Gima is not going to make it. However, anything can happen at Three Rivers. Well, certainly it can. But when you go back to that restart, because that's where Gima lost it and where Bianchi really won it. That's right. But you still have to get through the corners. The tires overheat. The concentration goes away. Dal Chin in third. Bianchi in first. But look how smooth he is coming out of that corner. And look how smooth he is turning in. The head moves as he looks across the corner. Very good car control. And there he goes. Through the Villeneuve Hesses. Now the quick left-hander over the curbing. Ready to take the checkered flag. Hard luck. Bruno Bianchi has finally won his first race of this season. Martin Guimont will finish second. And congratulations to his crew. They've seen a lot of unhappiness so far this season. But now the joy of their first win for Bruno Bianchi. If you're going to win one, win it at Three Rivers. And here comes Lou McKenzie. He wins in beat class for cars older than 1984. And for the retired Major General, his third win of the season. Well, good for Bruno and good for Lou McKenzie. Bruno deserved that one. As I said before, Vic, you're going to win one, win it at three rivers. There is none bigger if you are a Quebec driver than Trois Rivières. Bruno Bianchi is the winner ahead of Martin Guimont. And when you look back, they'll point at that restart and the 10 lap sprint. That's what won it for Bianchi as Lou McKenzie wins in B class.
Well, those of you who saw the race from Mont Tremblant realize and saw the disappointment of Bianchi's crew there. Well, now they get to celebrate their first win of the season as Bruno Bianchi gave the uh, thumbs up to Martin Guimau, his first win here at Trois Rivières. Uh, the first, after the first start, I, uh, I had pulled away from Martin, had a uh, seven second uh, in front of him uh, before the red flag. Then the red flag came out. That's why a new race, 11 laps remaining. So I say I'm going to try to pull away at the first first lap. That's work out. And after two lap, I had a lead of about five seconds. I keep pu pushing until the checker flag, and that's all. Let's remember now, DDA Scranton didn't race. Martin Guimont is your new points leader. Uh, the pause in the middle didn't. It was just a break, you know. Time to recuperate. <laughs> but uh, no, I had a good race. I, I couldn't really compete with Bruno, but uh, had a good race. Well, it was a good race. You know, we, we didn't ha quite have it to keep up to Martin and Bruno, but uh, we were still third quickest, and we had no problem being in third at all. It was in a good race for us. For the third time this year, Lou McKenzie is a winner in B-Class. Well, driving a B-Class car, it's fun running with some of those A-Class fellas. And uh, Nigel is preparing the car. It's beautiful, and it's stuck all the way, and we won by over a minute, so I'm delighted. Big lead in the uh, points championship now. You bet. Look at that. 75 and a half points. Lou McKenzie, the leader, in front of Lee Rassico. Of course, that in B class, cars older than 1984. Now, one of the reasons Esso goes racing is to continue the research and development of Esso products, such as the new Esso 100% synthetic engine oil. What we're really interested in the racing environment is how the uh, racing circuit uh, degrades oil quality. And we're convinced that our conventional oils that have improved significantly in the last few years with the upgrade in, uh, in oil categories will actually survive in this environment. It's a little hard convincing the, uh, the, the car drivers and the engine builders of this. And so what we're doing now is we're taking oil samples, and we don't care what oil they're using. We'll analyze any of the oils, and we're really looking for how the oils are breaking down. Our expectation is, is that there's going to be wear debris that's coming from the engine and going into the into the oil. We'll be measuring the level of that debris, and we'll also be measuring the breakdown of things like viscosity that the oil uh, needs to have to give the engine proper protection. So we're going to analyze the oils, uh, compare our the performance of our Protec oil, which actually won the B class today. Uh, the winning car had our Protec 20W50, and uh, and and try and uh, we're, we're convinced, but try and convince the racing community that our oils are doing as good a job as the as the national brands. Today's race was brought to you in part by SO Protec, the leader in protection, engineered in Canada for superior protection. By BF Goodrich Tires, because no other tires will do. And by Mini Disc from Sony, the smaller recordable compact disc. Just a reminder to join us for the final race of the series from Mont Tremblant. Until then, on behalf of John Powell and our entire crew, I'm Vic Broder. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye from Trois Rivières. Oh,